classification of matter. Well, what is matter? That's a different question than what's the matter, right? What is matter? Matter can be defined as anything that occupies space and has mass. So your textbook, my calculator, my Diet Dr. Pepper, one of my favorite kinds of matter. Your body, it's matter. Anything that has mass and occupies space. A specific instance, a specific kind of matter is called a substance. So Diet Dr. Pepper is a substance. Plastic is a substance. Can you think of something that is not matter? Thoughts. Thoughts. I heard air. Now that's a good one, air. Is air matter? Can air take up space? Yeah, how do you fill up a balloon? You blow air into it and it takes up space. It's not immediately obvious that, that air has mass, but it does. Did you have a? A photon, okay. A photon is not matter. That depends on who you're talking to. A photon, <laughs> yeah, if you're talking to a theoretical physicist or quantum mechanical chemist, um, they're going to kind of argue with you about that. Um, when we get to the very, very small um, individual packets of light are called photons. And those are really a form of energy, and yet sometimes they behave like particles. So then you're like, well, I don't know. But we don't need to, to worry about that right now. Um, how about love? Is love matter? Depends on your definition of love. Depends on your definition of love. But does it have physical mass? That's interesting. Chemical combinations of, of, you know, like pheromones and hormones and things. And I heard somebody over here say, say uh, does love matter? I think we can all agree, right? Love matters, but love is not matter, okay? So we can have fun with words. So matter, um, we're talking about, you know, things like air. Helium gas is matter. Water is matter. Um, dirt is matter, your cat is matter, all kinds of things. We can classify that matter in different ways. Scientists like to take this big complicated universe and put things into categories because that can help us to understand them. And just like you can take Lego bricks and group them in different ways. You can separate them by color, you can separate them by shape, you can separate them by what set they came from. There's all different ways. And so we have different ways of classifying matter. We can classify it by its state, its physical form, or by its composition, what is making up the matter. And we'll look at both of these methods of classification. States of matter, we will talk about three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. There is a fourth state called a plasma. We're not going to talk about plasmas in this class. So um, some of you may be disappointed, but sorry. So solids, liquids, and gases. Um, the state of matter changes based on the temperature of the matter. We can go from a solid to a liquid by raising the temperature. And if you think about water, we're familiar with this, right? If water gets really cold, what happens? It freezes and becomes ice. That is the solid form of water, but it's still water. If we heat it up, it becomes liquid water. And if we heat it up still further, it boils and or evaporates and becomes water in the gas state. There is water in the air. We call it humidity, right? So that's in the gas state. And here we have illustrations of a substance in each of these states. In the solid state, the particles are close together, and they're not moving around. There are also three physical states of students. Did you know that? So right now, you guys are in the solid state. You're all sitting in your stools or leaning against the doorway, you know, because we don't have enough chairs, I'm sorry but you're not moving relative to each other. 
The person who was behind you five minutes ago is still behind you, right? You're stationary, and that's the way the particles are in a solid. They're also quite close to each other. Are solid particles completely immobile? Are they moving at all? They are moving, they're just not moving relative to each other. Are you guys moving? I hope so, or you'd be dead. Your heart's beating, you're breathing. Um, I don't see anybody snoring yet. Some of you are taking notes, fidgeting, you know, whatever, shifting. You're all moving a little bit, but not relative to each other. And that's what happens in a solid. The particles in a solid, you know, my, my calculator case here is made out of plastic. The molecules in the plastic are vibrating. They're wiggling back and forth. But they're not moving relative to each other, or it would be a liquid and it would drip out of my hand onto the floor. You heat it up, though. The particles move more and more, and eventually they're able to move relative to each other. So this is the liquid state. The liquid state of students is like during lab where everybody gets up and we're going over to the bounces and we're going to the hood and we're milling about. We're all still very close together, but we're moving relative to each other. And that's what happens in a solid, uh, I'm sorry, a liquid. In a gas, the particles are much farther apart from each other. They're moving relative to each other and there's a great deal of distance between them. That's what happens when class is over and everybody goes out the door. You guys go off in all different directions you're not related to each other at all, and there's lots of space between you. So that's the gas state of students. Let's go over these states real briefly. So in solid matter, the particles are packed close to each other um, in fixed locations, but they, they vibrate. They vibrate, but they don't move relative <coughs> to each other. So a solid has a fixed volume. Um, I need a color that matches. So we have a fixed volume and a rigid shape. The examples there are ice, aluminum, and diamonds. If you take a piece of ice out of the freezer and put it on the counter, does it change its shape immediately? No. As long as it's frozen, it's going to keep its shape. That's a, a rigid shape. It's not going to change based on what container it's in. And the volume will retain this, uh, remain the same as well. Um, we can divide solids into two large groups, crystalline or amorphous. So here's an illustration of a crystalline solid, a diamond. Carbon atoms, and they are arranged in a very specific pattern. So in a crystalline solid, the particles are arranged in a very definite order. So right now, you guys, for the most part, are a crystalline solid of students because you're sitting in rows. There's an arrangement of students. Amorphous means without shape. When a cartoon character or a superhero morphs, what do they do? They change shape. Morph refers to shape. The prefix a means without. So amorphous means without shape. An amorphous solid, such as glass or plastic, the particles have no repeating order. And this would be like kindergarten students coming around the teacher and sitting on the floor for story time. They're not going to sit in rows. They're just going to pile on top of each other, and they'll just be a big mass of kindergartners there. Right? Remember kindergarten? It was a while ago, huh? Wasn't life simple then? I have a first grader, and he doesn't know how good he has it. Okay, liquid. In the liquid, um, the particles are still very close, um, but they're free to move relative to each other. And because of this, although liquids have fixed volumes, I should underline that since I underlined on the last slide. Uh, fixed volumes, oops, there we go. Um, but not a fixed shape. If you take a cup of water and pull, pour it into, um, a 9 by 13 cake pan. Does the shape of the water change? Yes, it does. If you take an, a frozen ice cube and you have it in a one cup measure and then you put it into the same pan, the shape doesn't change. Solids don't change shape based on their containers, but liquids do. Um, 
It's the, that possibility of movement between the particles that allows a liquid to take on the shape of its container. And liquids, uh, solids can't do that. Examples, um, water, alcohol, gasoline, these are all things that are liquids at room temperature. In a gas, there's a lot of space between the particles. And they are also free to move relative to each other. And because of these two properties, gases are compressible. So here we have two pictures. This is a piston. Here we have a liquid. And if we try to push down on this piston and squish the liquid closer together, it's not going to work. The particles are already touchingly close. You can't squeeze them together anymore. Liquids are not compressible. That's, that's a good thing, or hydraulics wouldn't work. The brakes on your car wouldn't work. Gases, though, have a lot of empty space. And so if you push down on this plunger, you can squeeze the particles closer together. Gases are compressible. So any questions about states of matter? The other way to classify matter is by composition. So here's a, a flow chart overview. So here we have matter. Then we have pure substances and mixtures. And pure substances are further divided into elements and compounds. Mixtures are divided into heterogeneous and homogeneous. So we'll talk about those in a little more detail. So pure substance or mixture. A pure substance contains only one kind of particle. And the composition is invariant, meaning it's always the same. So if we think about water, so water is one oxygen and two hydrogens. Kind of looks like a puppy or Mickey Mouse. There's always one oxygen with two hydrogens attached to it. Every particle of pure water is the same. And that water, all the particles are the same, regardless of where that water came from. If, it, if you got water out of the sewer and got all the other stuff out of it and purified it just so it's the water, it's H2O. If you got water from the Nile River, it's H2O. If you got water from Evian, bottled water, it's H2O. You know, when we drink water from the tap and you go to different cities, it tastes a little different. That's because it's not pure water. It's got some other things in it. But the water itself, all the particles are the same. Water is a pure substance. A mixture has two or more different kinds of particles, and they can be mixed in different amounts. I can't think of another example, so I'm just going to go with the example I used yesterday. So here, this is hydrogen gas, and this is oxygen gas. Same two kinds of atoms, hydrogen and oxygen. This is, uh, this is H2O, that's water. You can have a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. It's, it's rather explosive. Um, if you fill a balloon with hydrogen and oxygen together and touch it with a match, it goes kaboom. Makes a really nice big explosion. Chemists like explosions as long as nobody gets hurt. But you could have a lot of hydrogen and a little bit of oxygen. You could have a lot of oxygen and a little bit of hydrogen. And if you look at the individual particles, there are two different kinds of particles. You might say, well, there's, there's the red and the, the black here as well. But this is the particle. It, they're stuck together. They're like super glued together. And so each of the particles is the same. So that's the difference between a pure substance and a mixture. Any questions? We can count, uh, classify or divide pure substances into two types, elements and compounds. And this has to do with whether they can be broken down or decomposed, made into simpler substances. So let's go back to um, water. So here is, you can see why I didn't go into art, right? I can't even draw a decent circle. So there's our little Mickey Mouse uh, water. Water can be chemically broken down. 
And you can try this one at home. There's lots of things you can't do at home, but this one you can do at home. Take a 9-volt battery and drop it in a, in a glass of tap water. What you'll see is bubbles coming from the um, blanking terminals of the battery. Because the electric current passing through the water is breaking the water into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. So here we have the O2, and here we have the H2. And you pass electric current through water, and you can break it into simpler substances. So, that's Mr. Volandi. He gets a little excited sometimes. So water is a pure substance, but it is a compound. Because just like a compound word or a compound sentence is, it's two or more things put together, and it can be taken apart. Hydrogen and oxygen are elements and cannot be taken apart into anything simpler. So, yeah, those gases are explosive. Hydrogen and oxygen are, are quite reactive and they'll, they'll make a nice boom. So you're thinking, well, what if I light a match above the surface of that tap water? You might get a little pop, uh, but you're not going to blow up your house, which is why I tell you about it because I don't think you can get hurt doing that. So an element is a substance that cannot be broken down into simpler substances. Elements are the basic building blocks. So you could think of, in terms of Legos, each element is a different kind of Lego brick. You can't cut a Lego brick in half with your bare hands. You just can't. That's the smallest piece. But you can combine Lego bricks and form compounds. Okay, so. Elements, a single type of atom, a single kind of particle. Compounds are two or more elements in a definite fixed ratio or proportion. Many elements are chemically reactive and combine with other elements to produce compounds. So, you know, we're talking about hydrogen and oxygen. You light a match in the presence of concentrated hydrogen and oxygen, it goes kaboom. There's a combustion reaction, and the product of that reaction is water, a compound. Um, most elements will combine with other things. They will react, and they will form compounds. And we're going to talk a lot more about how they do that. So that was the pure substances. Mixtures contain two or more different components, and the proportions can vary. We divide these into two categories, heterogeneous and homogeneous. We use a lot of prefixes and suffixes in chemistry. Hetero is a prefix that means different. And homo is a prefix that means the same. So a heterogeneous mixture has something different. There's differences in it. And a homogeneous mixture is the same throughout. It's all the same. And so these divisions come about by how uniformly those two substances mix. Heterogeneous mixture, you have the composition varying from one region to another. Um, let's think about mixing oil and, and water. You mix oil and water, and you, you shake it up, and you set it down, and what happens? It separates. The oil goes to the top, and the water goes to the bottom. Is it a mixture? Yeah, you have two substances in that container, but it's not homogeneous. The top is very different from the bottom. Think about chocolate milk. So you take a glass of milk, and you pour some Hershey's syrup in it, and you stir it all up, yummy chocolate milk. And then you wait 10 minutes, and what happens to the chocolate? It goes to the bottom. And it's more chocolatey at the bottom and less chocolatey at the top. That's a heterogeneous mixture. You put spaghetti sauce on spaghetti, and you mix it up. It's a mixture. There's two things there, but it's not homogeneous. You can see the noodles in the spaghetti, right? There's differences. You mix salt and sand. The particles are really small, but if you look closely, you can see that's a sand, crystal, sand particle, and that's a salt crystal. They don't mix up uniformly. 
In a homogeneous mixture, you have lots, two or more substances, but they mix together very thoroughly. So think about putting sugar into a cup of tea. And you stir it up, just like the chocolate milk. But now if you wait, does the sugar settle to the bottom? No, nope. not if it was dissolved to start with. It will stay dissolved. It's a homogeneous mixture. The top is just as sweet as the bottom, as the middle, as the left, as the right. The composition is the same throughout. It mixes thoroughly. When you look at a homogeneous mixture, it looks like a pure substance. You don't see lumps or layers or anything like that. But it's a mixture because it's two separate substances. Um, one thing that helps us distinguish mixtures from pure substances like compounds is that mixtures can be separated based on differences in the properties of the components. So salt and sand, how could you separate the salt and the sand? Water. So if we put water in there, what's the salt going to do? It will dissolve in the water. Will the sand dissolve in water? No. Nope. The salt and the sand have different properties. And then how would we separate the salty water from the sand? We could, you could let the sand settle down, and you could carefully pour the water out. Or you could pour it through the coffee filter, right? And that would catch the sand and let the salty water go through. So there are lots of different techniques to separate mixtures. Um, and it's one of those, a lot of science is problem solving. And you know, you're like, OK, I've got these two things, and they're mixed together, and I have to figure out, figure out how to separate them. And it's a challenge, and it can be fun and really, really frustrating. But, so sand and water, you could separate by decanting. And that's what we're talking about with the salty water. You have the sand and water mixed together, and you let the sand settle to the bottom, and you gently pour the liquid off the top without disturbing the sand, and you can separate. That's one way to separate things. Uh, distillation is another method. If you have a homogeneous mixture of liquids, say ethanol and water, they mix together really nicely. How do you separate them? Well, alcohol, ethanol, has a lower boiling point than water does. It evaporates more easily. And so we can use that difference in distillation to separate. So here in this flask, we have our mixture of alcohol and water, say, and we heat that up. The more volatile substance, the alcohol, will evaporate or boil first and go into the gas state and try to run away. But we're going to trap it and make it go through this tube. It's called a condenser. It's got two walls. And in between the walls, we run cold water. So as that warm ethanol gas comes through here and gets cold, it condenses back into a liquid. And then it runs out and drips over here. And we can collect it in a flask. And in this way, we can separate the alcohol. And the water gets left behind. You've heard of moonshine, right? We actually, you know, we were actually watching some TV over Christmas break, and uh, came across this. Uh, I don't know what planet, what planet. It was on Animal Planet about these guys making moonshine in the stills in the, out in the woods, and that that's it exactly. That's what they're doing. They don't use fancy glassware like this, but it's the same principle. They gather something together a mash, and they ferment it. Um, microorganisms cause the sugars to turn into alcohol. But then they want to get just the alcohol out, or most of the alcohol out. And so you do that by distilling. Uh, it is illegal to do that yourself, so don't try that at home. You can get a license to do that, apparently. Um, what if you have an insoluble solid and a liquid, like the sand and the water? Well, you can decant. But you can also filter. And this is uh, what you're doing when you separate the coffee grounds from the coffee, when you're making coffee in the morning. Or if you're cooking spaghetti, you put the spaghetti in the boiling water, and you cook it, and now you've got to get the spaghetti out of the water. Well, you can pick it out with a spoon or tongs, but that's pretty tedious. 
easier thing is to pour it through a funnel. A colander is just a very coarse funnel, a bowl with holes in it. This looks more like a coffee filter, it's a piece of filter paper. Pour your mixture in here. The liquid will go through the paper and the solid won't. And we'll be doing that in the lab this semester. Any questions?